Welcome back to this series on reinforcement learning. In this episode, we'll be creating this. We'll be bringing together all the classes and functions we've created so far and incorporating them into our main program to train our DeepQ network for the cart and pull environment. Hey, by the way, do you know that Deep Lizard has a vlog? If you want to connect with us in a totally different light, then come check out the vlog and say hi. Link in the description. All right, let's get to it. Within our main program, we're first initializing all of our hyperparameters. Note that these parameters are the ones that we'll want to tune and experiment with to try to improve performance. In later episodes, we'll see some of this experimentation in action. We're first setting the batch size for our network to 256. Gamma, which is the discount factor used in the Bellman equation, is being set to 0.999. We then have these three EPS variables, EPS start, EPS end, and EPS decay. EPS start is the starting value of epsilon. Remember, epsilon is the name we've given to the exploration rate. EPS end is the ending value of epsilon, and EPS decay is the decay rate we'll use to decay epsilon over time. We've covered the exploration rate in full detail in an earlier episode, so if you need a refresher, be sure to check that out. Next, we set target update to 10, and this is how frequently, in terms of episodes, we'll update the target network's weights with the policy network's weights. So with target update set to 10, we're choosing to update the target network every 10 episodes. Next, we set the memory size, which is the capacity of the replay memory, to 100,000. We then set the learning rate that's used during training of the policy net to 0.001, and the number of episodes we want to play to 1,000. That's it for the hyperparameters. Now, we'll set up all of the essential objects using the classes we've built in previous episodes. First though, let's set up our device for PyTorch. This tells PyTorch to use a GPU if it's available, and otherwise to use the CPU. Now we set up our environment manager EM using the cart pull env manager class, and we pass in the required device. We then set our strategy to be an instance of the epsilon greedy strategy class, and we pass in the required start, end, and decay values for epsilon. We then define an agent using our agent class and pass in the required strategy, number of actions available, and device. We then initialize memory to be an instance of replay memory and pass in the capacity using memory size. Now we define both our policy network and target network by creating two instances of our DQN class and passing in the height and width of the screen to set up the appropriate input shape for the networks. We put these networks on our defined device using PyTorch's to function. We then set the weights and biases in the target net to be the same as those in the policy net using PyTorch's state dict and load state dict functions. We also put the target net into eval mode, which tells PyTorch that this network is not in training mode. So in other words, this network will only be used for inference. Lastly, we set optimizer equal to the atom optimizer, which accepts our policy net parameters as those for which we'll be optimizing, and our defined learning rate. We're now all set up to start training. We're going to be storing our episode durations during training in order to plot them using the plot function we developed last time. So we create this empty list to store them in. The steps we'll be covering now in our main training loop will be the implementation of this algorithm that we covered in a previous episode. So if at any point you get lost where something in the upcoming code fits in, be sure to refresh your memory by taking a look at this. We're now stepping into our training loop. This first loop is going to iterate over each episode. For each episode, we first reset the environment, then get the initial state. Now we step into this nested for loop that will iterate over each time step within each episode. For each time step, our agent selects an action based on the current state. Recall, we also need to pass in the required policy net since the agent will use this network to select its action if it exploits the environment rather than explores it. 
The agent then takes the chosen action and receives the associated reward, and we get the next state. We now can create an experience using the state, action, next state, and reward, and push this experience onto replay memory. After which, we transition to the next state by setting our current state to next state. So now that our agent has had an experience and stored it in replay memory, we'll check to see if we can get a sample from replay memory to train our policy net. Remember, we covered in a previous episode that we can get a sample equal to the batch size from replay memory as long as the current size of memory is at least the batch size. So if we can get a sample from memory, then we get a sample equal to batch size and assign this sample to the variable experiences. We're then going to do some data manipulation to extract all the states, actions, rewards, and next dates into their own tensors from this experiences list. We do this by using the extract tensors function. We haven't yet covered the inner workings of this function, but stick around until the end and we'll circle back around to cover it in detail. For now, let's continue with our training loop so that we can stay in flow. All right, so now we get the Q values for the corresponding state action pairs that we've extracted from the experiences in our batch. We do this using qvalues.getCurrent, to which we pass our policy net, states, and actions. We'll be covering the qvalues class later as well, but for now, you should just know that getCurrent will return the qvalues for any given state action pairs as predicted from the policy network. The qvalues will be returned as a PyTorch tensor. We also need to get the qvalues for the next states in the batch as well. We're able to do this using qvalues.getNext and passing in the target net and the next states that we extracted from experiences. This function will return the maximum Q values for the next states using the best corresponding next actions. It does this using the target network because remember, when we want to get the Q values for the next states, we're doing that using the target net. These key values will also be returned as a PyTorch tensor. Now we can calculate the target key values using this formula. We multiply each of the next key values by our discount rate gamma and add this result to the corresponding reward in the rewards tensor to create a new tensor of target key values. We now can calculate the loss between the current key values and the target key values using mean squared error as our loss function, and then we zero out the gradients using optimizer.zerograd. This function sets the gradients of all the weights and biases in the policy net to zero. Since PyTorch accumulates the gradients when it does backprop, we need to call zerograd before backprop occurs. Otherwise, if we didn't zero out the gradients each time, then we'd be accumulating gradients across all backprop runs. We now call loss.backward, which computes the gradient of the loss with respect to all the weights and biases in the policy net. Then we call step on our optimizer, which updates the weights and biases with the gradients that were computed when we called backward on our loss. We can now check to see if the last action our agent took ended the episode by getting the value of done from our environment manager. If the episode ended, then we append the current time step to the episode durations list to store how long this particular episode lasted. We then plot the duration and the 100 period moving average to the screen and break out of the inner loop so that we can now start a new episode. Before starting this new episode though, we have one final check to see if we should do an update to our target net. Recall our target update variable is set to 10, so we check if our current episode is a multiple of 10, and if it is, then we update the target net weights with the policy net's weights. Then we can start a new episode. This whole process will end once we've reached the number of episodes set in num episodes. And that's it for the training loop. We'll run this in just a moment to see what our training looks like, both from our progress being plotted on the chart, as well as by checking out how the cart and pull performance in the environment changes as the agent learns. Before we do that though, let's circle back to the extract tensors function that I mentioned we'd come back to and see what's happening there. 
Remember, this is the function that we called to extract all the states, actions, rewards, and next states into their own tensors from a given experience batch. Extract tensors accepts a batch of experiences and first transposes it into an experience of batches. I know this step sounds kind of weird, right? So let's look at an example of what we're doing in this first step before we move on. First, let's create three sample experiences and put them in a list and let's just check out how that looks. So we can see the first experience in the list has a state, action, next state, and reward all equal to one. Similarly, the second experience has two as the value of all of its attributes, and the third experience has three as the value for all of its attributes. Now we execute the same line from our function that we're trying to understand. So if we execute this and print it out, we can see that we do now indeed have this experience object where the state attribute is set to the tuple containing all the states from E1, E2, and E3 in the original experiences list. Similarly, the action, next state, and reward attributes contain tuples which contain all the corresponding values from the experience list. So now that we see what this line does, let's go back to extract tensors to see what happens next. We call the result of this operation we just demonstrated batch. And then by calling torch.cat, we extract all the states from this batch into their own state tensor. We go through this same process with all the actions, rewards, and next states as well, and then return a tuple that contains the states tensor, actions tensor, rewards tensor, and next states tensor. We now have one last thing to cover, the QValues class. This is the class that we use to calculate the Q values for the current states using the policy net and the next states using the target net. This class contains two static methods, meaning that we're able to call these methods without creating an instance of the class first. Because we're creating the class in this way, we're setting up its own device since we won't be creating an instance of this class and passing in the device from our main program. As you can see, device here is defined in the exact same way as we defined it in our main program earlier. The first static method is get current. This function accepts a policy net, states, and actions. When we call this function in our main program, recall that these states and actions are the state action pairs that were sampled from replay memory. So the states and actions correspond with each other. The function just returns the predicted Q values from the policy net for the specific state action pairs that were passed in. The next static method is get next. This function is a bit more technical than anything else we've covered so far in this episode. So if you have any trouble understanding the first time, don't worry, just replay and take it slow. It requires your attention, so here we go. This function accepts a target net and next states. Recall that for each next state, we want to obtain the maximum Q value predicted by the target net among all possible next actions. To do that, we first look in our next state sensor and find the locations of all the final states. If an episode is ended by a given action, then we call the next state that occurs after that action was taken the final state. Remember, final states are represented with an all-black screen. Therefore, all the values within the tensor that represent that final state would be zero. We want to know where the final states are, if we even have any at all in a given batch, because we're not going to want to pass these final states to our target net to get a predicted Q value. We know that the Q value for final states is zero, because the agent is unable to receive any reward once an episode has ended. So we're finding the locations of these final states so that we know not to pass them to the target net for Q value predictions when we pass our non-final states. To find the locations of these potential final states, we first flatten the next state's tensor along dimension one, and we check each individual next state to find its maximum value. If its maximum value is equal to zero, then we know that this particular next state is a final state, 
and we represent that as a true within this final state locations tensor. Next states that are not final are represented by a false value in this tensor. We then create this second tensor, non-final state locations, which is just an exact opposite of final state locations. It contains true for each location in the next state's tensor that corresponds to a non-final state, and it contains false for each location that corresponds to a final state. Now that we know the locations of the non-final states, we can now get the values of these states by indexing into the next state's tensor and getting all the corresponding non-final states. Next, we find out the batch size by checking to see how many next states are in the next state's tensor. Using this, we create a new tensor of zeros that has a length equal to the batch size. We also send this tensor to the device defined at the start of this class. We then index into this tensor of zeros with the non-final state locations, and we set the corresponding values for all these locations equal to the maximum predicted Q values from the target net across each action. This leaves us with a tensor that contains zeros as the Q values associated with any final state and contains the target net's maximum predicted Q values across all actions for each non-final state. This result is what is finally returned by git next. So the whole point of all this code in this function was to find out if we have any final states in our next states tensor. If we do, then we need to find out where they are so that we don't pass them to the target net. We don't want to pass them to the target net for a predicted Q value since we know that their associated Q values will be zero. The only reason this may seem a little more complicated is due to the use of tensors and how we're indexing into them. So again, just spend a little more time on this one and it should all come together for you. Now just one quick update before we get into training. I've added a print statement to the plot function we defined last time so that in addition to the plot on the screen, we could also have a printout of the moving average at the current episode. So make sure to update your code with this change if you were following along in real time with the code last time. And here is just the same example plot from last time, but with the added printout. All right, that wraps up all the code. Let's finally run our main program and check out our performance. I'm going to time lapse this since it does take some time to run. All right, so we can see that the agent definitely did learn over time, but it didn't ever solve cart and pole because the 100 episode moving average never reached a duration of 195 or more. We'll see in a future episode how we can experiment with tuning our hyperparameters and network architecture to increase performance. In the meantime though, I strongly encourage you to test and tune these parameters yourself and see if you can get the agent to perform any better than this. If you can, comment with what you changed and what 100 episode moving average you were able to achieve. Please like this video to let us know you're learning and be sure to check out the blog for this video on deeplizard.com and take the corresponding quiz to test your own understanding. Don't forget about the Deep Lizard Hive Mind for exclusive perks and rewards and come say hi to us on our blog channel. Link in the description. See you in the next one. Hello again. First time talking to you since the last episode. I wonder though, are you hearing me? Do you enjoy the little bits of insight I've been sharing with you at the end of each episode? If so, let me know in the comments because, I'd like to avoid sharing existential insights to an empty room. If no one comments to let me know, well then, that's depressing. <laughs>